Hi, everyone. So I think these are very exciting times because it seems that we're pushing the limits of observations into higher and higher redshifts. And I think it's just stress the point why it's so important to understand what were the conditions of the formation of the first luminous objects. And you all know that because you came to this workshop. And this is what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the gas rich halo in a very high redshift. And we all know why they are important, as I said. They very well may be the nurturing grounds of the first galaxies, but even if they were too small to form a luminous object, so even if they were too small for the gas to cool down and form a luminous object, they can still play a very important role just by absorbing ionized radiation and delaying maybe the ionization, as Avi mentioned in, uh, in his talk, and maybe even produce a very clear signal on the 21 centimeter. So I'm going to talk about the, the gas in this very high redshift halos. And um, I added an implication, so if I'll get to it, I'll. I'll add some uh, few interesting, maybe, I think there are interesting implications. So um, I'm going to talk, as I said, about the gas, but then I'm going to use two uh, different tools. I'm going to use linear theory, and I'm going to use simulations. So from linear theory, we can understand the overall trend of the evolution, what's going on, the average behavior. And from simulations, we can have a very detailed calculations of the physics. And I'm going to use them both. But the problem is saying I want to estimate the gas fraction at high redshift, it's a little bit vague. And I need to know how to relate my, uh, yeah, I, I love the, the pointer, thank you. Uh, and I need to uh, phrase my question in a scientific way. So I need to phrase my question um, with relate to the, to the different tools that I'm going to use. So using linear theory, I'll ask, what is the minimum halo mass at which uh, baryonic overdensities uh, can still grow? So above this, above this mass, we, we expect to have some kind of growth of overdensities, and below it, we expect a suppression. And using simulations, I will ask, uh, what is the minimum mass that holds most of its baryon during formation? So. These are two different questions that I have to phrase differently because I'm using different tools, but it's not very clear if I'll get the same uh, answer from them. So uh, let me give you the punchline. The punchline is yes, I'm getting the same punchline. Uh, the, the same punchline. I'm getting the same answer from both of them. I'll show you that there is a nice agreement, as one would hope that there will be, between uh, linear theory and simulations, and we can use linear theory to understand what's going on in the nonlinear behaviors. I'll, um, I'll add the stream velocity, and Dimitri just left, but um, <laughs> yeah, that's not too good. <laughs> but uh, Avi mentioned uh, the stream velocity. I'll explain a little bit about it uh, in a few slides. And I'll add that. I'll add what I'm calling the complete heating. I'll show you how important it is to understand what was the history of the baryon during the evolution of the universe. And I'll show you the agreement. And I'll show you that, that sometimes we have deviations from linear theory, and we can understand that at least we can guess what is the meaning for it. OK, so starting from linear theory, I'm reminding you, the question is, what is the minimum hello mass at which baryons over densities can still grow? And you all should yell the answer and say, yeah, maybe you should use the genes mass. So. Uh, indeed, the genes mass is the mass associated with the scale of which we balance gravity and pressure. But it gives us only a uh, snapshot through time, and we want to actually have some kind of, of time averaging genes mass. We want to understand the entire history of the halo. Another problem that the genes mass has is that it assumes that the, the halo is isolated, and we have a lot of modes in our universe. So first of all, this is the genes mass, and this is the time averaging genes mass. This was introduced by Nick Nedden in 98. And the problem with, uh, with what I'm calling the old calculation of the filtering mass, there are two problems. First problem is that assumes that the universe has some kind of uniform speed of sound to it. And the other problem is that uh, the fluctuations 
that this calculation is assumed that the fluctuations of the baryons were equal to the fluctuations of the dark matter at high redshift. So these both arguments are uh, problematic. So first of all, before recombination, the baryons were tightly coupled to the radiation. So they were, uh, uh, all of their, um, all of their over densities were smoothed out. This is what I, I was keeping doing. But the dark matter could just uh, grow. The dark matter really d does not care about the, the radiation. So at time of recombination, we find that there is almost five orders of magnitude difference between the amplitude of the, of the baryons over density and the, bary and the dark matter over densities, where the baryons are much more suppressed compared to the dark matter. Also. There is another thing here, um, the speed of sound. So C and B photons continue to scatter over the residual free electrons that left over, left over residual uh, electrons from uh, recombination. And they kept the, the temperature of the gas coupled to the temperature of the C and B until roughly a uh, redshift of 200, 150. And after that, uh, the temperature of the gas um, Cooled adiabatically, but still the over density, the over density's uh, effect. Sorry, this effect had an effect on the over density. This is a bad sentence, but what I meant, <laughs> what I meant basically, that the Compton heating had a huge effect on the fluctuations of the baryons, and how much of effect is that? So if you wonder, then I'm answering. Here is the effect. So here we, I plotted the fluctuations of the temperature of the baryons over the fluctuations of the baryons themselves as a function of the wave number. And here is the, all the curves with the wigglies. There are two curves with wigglies. This is the brown curve and the, and the red curve. These are for the calculation assuming variation of the speed of sound for the universe. And the horizontal curves are simply assuming that the speed of sound of the universe is uniform, and that means that the fluctuations of the temperature is proportional to the fluctuations of the baryons, simply. So all this, this is, for example, um, CMB fast assumed that, for example. But if we are calculating it correctly, we see that there is a huge effect, even at redshift 20, which is the brown compared to the cyan. So yes, there is an effect for uh, speed of sound. So now, and as I mentioned, I will talk about uh, the stream velocity, but for now, let's keep it um, more simple and leave it out. But I started by telling you that it's important for the filtering mass. So let's see if it's important to the filtering mass. So without uh, stream velocity, yes, it's very important to the filtering mass. So this is the new calculation of the filtering mass. Assuming that the fluctuations of the baryons are not equal to the fluctuations of the dark matter at early times and varying the speed of sound. And you see that there is almost order of magnitude difference here. OK. But as I tell the tale about the baryons before recombination, there is something that I left out that Dmitry, good that you returned, uh, Dmitry Tsalakovich and Chris Hirata had uh, shown very recently that not only we need to take into account the fact that these two amplitudes are, are not the same, but also that there is a relative velocity between the baryons and, uh, and, the, um, and the dark matter, simply because they did not start from the same initial conditions. And it has been coined as the stream velocity. And I will go over it very quickly. They showed that there is an um, uh, effect for the, on the power spectrum. There is a suppression. So this is with the effect. There's a suppression of the power spectrum. And what's important for um, my talk is the filtering mass. So here is the filtering mass that I showed you before. It was the red curve before, uh, no stream velocity. This is the genes mass. See, this is a total different behavior. And here is how you calculate the filtering mass, but with one sigma effect of the stream velocity, and this is with two sigma effect for the stream velocity. So first of all, you see that it's higher by almost the order of magnitude when, uh, from the previous filtering mass when you're not assuming any uh, stream velocity. And second, you see that the behavior is different. So if the genes mass changed dramatically over time, the 
filtering mass almost stayed constant for the one sigma effect at, uh, at 210 to the 5. OK, so I promised simulations, not just linear. So here, let's, uh, let's see what's going on with simulations. So we're moving from linear theory to simulations. Um, so in simulations, let me remind you the question. The question in simulations is, what is the minimum mass um, that keeps most of its baryon during formation. Now, I've moved to, I moved to simulations because I feel like somehow I answered the, the linear question. I was able to, uh, to produce what is the, the minimum mass that suppresses most of the, um, of the growth of over densities. But here in, in simulations, I'm going to use this formula um, invented, I should say, by Nick. And if you think about it, this formula for if you put here a characteristic mass, which is some kind of mass which will figure out what it is, you will find that the gas fraction in your halo is half of the mean cosmic uh, baryon fraction. And if you'll put a very large mass, I'm sorry, if you'll put the characteristic mass, you get it as half. Did I say half? I don't know. It's recorded. We can check. But. Um, <laughs> It's half of that, and if we take a very high mass, it approaches slowly to this value here. And if the mass is very, very small, then at the end, uh, we don't get nothing. So I'm going to just make a fit in my simulations. So this is a, whatever this formula means, I don't really care, as long as I know that in some way there is some slope here par parameterized by alpha that gives something. I don't know if, it's, if this alpha is um, global or not. This is a uh, subject for another talk that we can spend a lot of time at. I don't know if we'll get to any meaningful answers. So I'm going to use this, um, this formula to fit everything. But before I'm starting to fitting something, we need to understand what, I, what is the simulations that I'm going to use and what is the importance of the initial conditions. So, I'm, I'm making a small step again to linear theory because I really like it. Um, so here, this is a, the set that of three different initial conditions that I'm considering. So I want to show you how important it is to, to know what are your initial conditions and simulations. And I'm sure that you all know that. But I just want to again stress the point, and I'm sorry if I'm boring you to death, but I'm having three different sets of simulations, each starting with different uh, initial conditions, what, which I call the fiducial model, where I'm taking into account the fact that there is a varying speed of sound to the baryons, and that the fluctuations of the baryons are not equal to the fluctuations of the dark matter. But I'm still not taking into account my stream velocity. I'll add it in a few moments. And in another thing, I just assume what people used to assume that the speed of sound is uniform. And another thing, I'm making a gross mistake assuming that the fluctuations of the baryons is equal to the fluctuations of the dark matter in my time where I'm starting my simulation, let's say redshift 99 or whatever you want. So just concentrate here. This is the initial conditions. This is comparing the fiducial model for the baryons uh, compared to the to this delta, the, the, assuming that the fluctuations of the baryons is equal to the fluctuations of the dark matter, and see how overestimate this model assumes compared to the complete heating model. And we can also look at, uh, at what happens to the baryons' initial conditions for the uniform speed of sound, which is here the, the blue curve. So it's about 30% difference. OK, so now we can start fitting all the fits. And I want to understand what is, the, what is the minimum mass that keeps most of the baryons. I just remind you the question. So here it is. I know it's not the perfect fit. I'll show you a better one in a few moments. And uh, I've, I've omitted from here the error bars because this plot is busy as it is. We can concentrate only on this, on this panel here, if you like. So the, um, the points are the results from the fit from the simulation. And the curves is the filtering mass itself. So this is for the fiducial model. And the green is for assuming that the fluctuations of the baryons is equal to the fluctuations of the dark matter. And the blue is assuming, the, um, um, assuming that the universe have a uniform speed of sound. So first of all, we see that there is an agreement between uh, 
I'll show you a better agreement in a, in a few moments. But we see that there is a, an agreement between linear theory and uh, simulations, which is very encouraging because it means that we actually, using linear theory, we can understand what is going on. We can also see that there, this has plays an important effect. The initial conditions is very important, as you know. Because if I'm, if I'm really interested about the first generations of galaxies, if I really want to understand the halo that could form the first luminous objects, I have to understand my, what my initial conditions that I input to my simulations that can produce uh, eventually this, this halo that I'm interested of. So we cannot neglect that. I know it's just stressing an obvious point, but I'm sorry. I really had to do it. So now let's move and add stream velocity. So I want to add stream velocity, and I'll um, do it in this fashion. I'll just add uh, uh, some velocity at, my begin at, the, at the initial state of my simulation. So first of all, this is a smaller box, maybe lower. Uh, it's a somewhat lower, uh, not maybe, somewhat lower particles. It, to tell you that size not always matters, or it is, but in that case, we actually need a smaller box, smaller something. Here you see um, the no stream velocity effect, and those of you who really paid attention and did not fall asleep could maybe and uh, could have maybe noticed that this curve is actually lower than the red curve that I showed you before. And let me just remind you. So here is the red curve is about between t. 2 to 3, 10 to the 4, and now I'm showing that the no stream velocity is uh, lower. Does anyone uh, know why? Anyone can guess? So, okay, I'll tell you the answer. So, <laughs> I used here uh, Gadget 2, and I started this simulation at Redshift 199, while uh, my sim the simulation that I showed you before is starting in 99, and in 199, um, the Compton effect that I stress a lot about uh, plays an important role, but Gadget 2 doesn't have any Compton scattering in it, and uh, so that's why effectively it's like the temperature is lower. So when I generated this line for the filtering mass, I assumed that I am in a simulation, therefore I neglected the Compton effect. But keep in mind that it's really important. <laughs> okay. And now I've added one sigma effect for, um, for the stream velocity. So I added one, uh, and one direction for the, um, uh, for the baryons. I've added this amount of, of, um, of velocity. And here we see the points. This is, again, the fit for the formula that I showed you that Nick has thought about it before. And this is um, the filtering mass. Again, for this filtering mass, I again assume that I'm in my simulation, so I'm starting at redshift 199 with the same initial conditions that I inputted for the simulation, and I've added artificially, as in the simulation, additional, uh, additional velocity. And you can ask me, no one asked me, so I'll ask myself, what does this discrepancy mean? And I think that this discrepancy is be because we still did not uh, form enough hellos here so we don't have enough hellos at, at redshift 40 here um, to be, so we will have the minimum mass that holds most of the baryons to be that much, because I, I'm not explaining this. Way. But what I'm, um, if the minimum mass that holds most of the baryons have to be 10 to the 5 almost, and I don't have 10 to the 5 solar masses here, so I just cannot have it. Okay, now let's, uh, do a kind of a tedious thing. Let's start adding more and more sigma effects because as the fluctuations itself, that the, there is a distribution, the, we can expect some kind of distribution for the stream velocity. So what happens if we have an, a higher sigma effect? So for a higher sigma effect, we're still in agreement. So this is nicer. Note that the error bars are larger, and they are larger because I have less and less hellos in that, in that regime. This is a tiny box to remind you. Now what will happen if I'm adding an even higher sigma effect? Whoa, okay, so here things got a little bit crazier. So first I omitted the, the error bars so it will be easier to look. And the magenta stars, again, this is from the simulation. I connected it so it will be easier to follow. Uh, the magenta stars are for 2.6 sigma effect. 
and the brown stars are for 3.4 sigma effect. And we can see that there is no agreement at all between the, the filtering mass, which are the, this magenta line, and the characteristic mass, which are the points. I did, however, plotted here something that, uh, while talking with Avi, uh, he has suggested. I plotted here what will be the genes mass, but instead of taking the speed of sound, which doesn't mean a lot right now, I took something which is like that, the, the um, a velocity which goes something like that. But note that at, the, at, these, at these velocities, the, the change, the difference between the speed of sound here and the stream velocity is of the or, or four order of magnitudes. So I could just have taken this. So it's kind of effective genes mass that, ta that takes into account the fact that the stream, the stream velocity dominates. So the thing to take from that plot is that, yeah, filtering mass, the linear theory predicts very well what's going on for the about two sigma effect, but when you go above it, then we, you just dominate it by the stream velocity. And you can say, well, maybe it's not a very good agreement. For that, I have a somewhat larger box that actually can resolve this, higher, this high uh, masses. So the error bars, by the way, for this set, for these sets are enormous also. So maybe it's not a very good measurement. So here is a somewhat higher, um, somewhat higher box, uh, larger box, more particles. Starting though in lower redshift, so it will not take forever for me to run it. And here, this I showed you before, this is no stream velocity. This is one sigma, again, a nice fit. And this is a 3.3 sigma. And again, the filtering mass from linear theory doesn't work. But uh, when we just have uh, genes mass dominated by the stream velocity, then we get some kind of uh, agreement. So to sum up this part of the, of the talk about the gas fraction at the high redshift, what have we learned? We learned something that we already knew. We knew that initial conditions is very important. And we saw that taking into account, um, taking into account the stream velocity, we have interesting and, and very exciting effects. And we still can use linear theory to understand what happened there. And we also use uh, some kind of maybe mix match, uh, not mix match, I don't know. I've, I lost the word in English, I'm sorry. But some kind of a combination between linear theory and, I don't know, ad hoc understanding that we have the, the stream velocity um, dominates when we have a high sigma effect. But I promised also some implications. So first of all, I want to talk about implications to the halo abundance. So Dimitri, in his first paper, also showed that taking into account, uh, we're returning for a moment to linear theory, taking into account the stream velocity, you should have some kind of suppression for the, uh, for the halo abundance. So this is the ratio of halo abundance um, with the stream velocity minus without the stream velocity over the halo abundance without the stream velocity. OK, so I can do something similar in my small box simulation. So I should mention that in my small box simulation, I artificially increased, increased the number of hellos. So I uh, had a sigma 8, which is 1.4. So I have a lot of hellos to test it. Or a lot is kind of a relative thing. So first, let's, um, let's uh, concentrate on the thin line here. The thin line is the same ratio that I showed you the prediction from linear theory a moment ago. This is, this is basically that. And this is I took only for the 1.7 uh, sigma, where I think that linear theory may, may be holding. And we see that there isn't much of effect. However, then I thought, well, maybe what the question that I should ask is, what is the hello abundance of, of the stream velocity simulation uh, compare to the non-stream velocity simulation, but instead of using all the hellos, I just want to take the hellos that have gas fraction, which is above the above the mean cosmic uh, the cosmic baryon fraction at my no stream velocity simulation. So this is kind of complicated. I'm saying I would have 
um, if there will not be a stream velocity, I would get to some kind of amount of, of, of gas fraction in my hellos. But since I have stream velocity, I'm suppressing the amount of gas in these hellos. So I'm comparing everything to the amount of gas in the no stream velocity case. And then I see some effect. And these are the thick lines. This is it. And here, actually, there is nothing. There is no more hellos that are above that. So we see effect, but not very, so this is different. I don't know if you can see it very well. This is 10 to the 5 solar masses, 10 to the 5 solar masses. And here is 10 to the 6 or 10 to the 5. So something interesting starting to happen, usually at 10 to the 5 solar masses. And I will skip that part. OK, another implication that you might ask yourself is how uh, the clump clumping factor is something that a lot of people like to talk about, especially in association with the evolution of ionized volumes. So we want to understand how, what's the clumpiness of, um, of the gas in, um, outside of hellos. So we're just making a very simple calculation just to, to measure what is the, uh, how much the gas is clumped outside of hellos. And so this is it with no, uh, with no stream velocity, and this is with 3.3 sigma. So there is like 40% difference effect. And not surprisingly, for the one sigma, there isn't much of effect. The effect is very insignificant. So, but this is more important for, so I'm going to use that in order to calculate what is the ionization, uh, the ionization volume. So I'm assuming some kind, I'm assuming some kind of, um, um, of evolution for the ionized, ionized fraction, taking from Birkenau Lobe 2001. And here is, so the green lines, I don't know if you can see good the green, well the green lines, but this is simply reproducing uh, Renan and Avi uh, plot. So this is while well, assuming that the clumping factor is 1, this is assuming that the clumping factor is 10, and this is no uh, recombination, just a sanity check to say that uh, everything is okay. And this is with the clumping factor when there is no uh, stream velocity and for a source at redshift of 15. And now what happens if I'm adding um, a stream velocity? So there is some kind of change. It's not very significant, again. So the, adding the stream velocity doesn't change by much the, the evolution of ionized volumes. So this is what we, we talked a little bit before, how much the clumpiness of, 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 uh, um, of, of, of the gas can actually delay ionization. So by here, we can say that it's not by much. But if my source is actually um, being turned on earlier, then there is, uh, I don't know, it's not, it's not very significant. It's a bit more significant than, than turning on a, a light source at, ten, at, at uh, 15. So here I'm turning it on at 30, and there is some kind of, of difference. Um, the last thing that I want to show you is, so uh, it's a somewhat of example. So why we even care about the filtering mass, it's not only because of the first generations of galaxies, so we want to understand how things have formed of this really uh, minimum mass. I mean, you can all say, well, I don't care. I'll just go a little bit in higher mass and look there and understand it there. But when we want to understand, for example, the 21 centimeter observations, we also need to understand what is the minimum cutoff. It gives us some kind of cutoff for the, for the mass that can form stars in a way, that can form luminous objects. So this is kind of a reminder um, that this is an example. So there's no, filter, there's no stream velocity here, but this is just a reminder that the, that the 21 centimeter should exhibit this cutoff. This cutoff actually happens because we have, uh, we have ionized bubbles around our galaxies. And the scale of this ionized bubble determines more or less by the halo itself. So if we know what is the minimum mass that, uh, that plays, plays the important role, then the cutoff here should change scale. So the scale is different. So we can gain some information from observing 21 centimeter on what happened in early times. So just to conclude, what have we learned? 
Well, again, I'm stating the obvious initial conditions are important. I also uh, showed that there is a very beautiful agreement between linear theory and nonlinear theory. We can understand the nonlinear behavior using linear theory. Um, we also that there is show we also saw that there is some kind of deviation at high reg at high sigma effect. I'm sorry, and I mean the logical explanation that comes into my mind is that it's simply dominated by the very large stream velocity. And if we assume this effective genes mass with the stream velocity dominates there, then we get the agreement. Um, we also showed that there isn't much of of uh, of effect for the hello abundance. So for the hello abundance, my guess, right now is just a guess, I'm making more tests, but my guess is that we need to start in higher redshifts in simulations in order to see this effect. And this is my guess, I'll test it. We show that there, is not, there isn't much of effect on the clumping factor and ionized volume. And the last minute, I just want to advertise this conference. Um, so this conference, I'm one of the organizers, and I urge you all to come. It's a, uh, we call it the future of astronomy. I know it's kind of, uh, <sighs> yeah. Anyways, um, this is uh, this conference where we have uh, very, uh, very good people who come to give talks, all of them at postdoc level. And we urge all of you to come and, and see it. It's in the September at Chicago. That's it. Thank you. Yeah. So for this, uh, for the stars, not very well. You can see that there is uh, some kind of a problem here, which is less. Uh, hold on. I mean, you see here that there is no problem for the higher resolution run. So for the higher resolution run, I get almost the same, uh, the same f sub z sub zero for. Uh, for the low redshift, but uh, the, sm the smaller box, I don't. But for most of them, apart from the very, very large sigma effect where this is very, very high, and I don't get it. This is why I don't trust that it had another simulation in a, in a larger box and, and better resolution. So if you're referring to my, to my paper with Renan, <laughs> so. Oh, but including these effects as well, so have you tried to revisit? So I did not try to revisit. I thought about it quite a lot. And I have decided that it will not matter much. And I, maybe I'm wrong. I know that you guys have talked about it probably too. But I think that, so um, just to repeat what Avi have asked me, and to, uh, so it will not be only. <laughs> talking between the two of us. So uh, there was, I had a paper with Renan a while ago where we asked this very simple question, what is the, oops, I'm sorry. Maybe I ruined everything now. I don't know if it records anymore. Um, so we asked, what is the most distant uh, luminous object that can form in our own past light cone? So this is a very simple question that one can ask. And all you need to do is just remind yourself that we only care to do an integration on, our, uh, on the universe. And we cannot do it, therefore, using simulations, because we cannot simulate the universe. But doing it analytically is very simple. We simply integrate it on everything, use Poisson fluctuations. Um, we also actually change the, the 
threshold for collapse, what is usually everyone will cite 1.686, it will not be 1.686 anymore because at high redshift you have uh, baryons fraction that matters and um, and also um, and also the radiation. So we took that into account and the result was redshift 65. But now Avi asked me what will be uh, the result when you take into account stream velocity. I think that there will not be because we have this 6.65 answer has a high sigma, uh, it's a high sigma peak. So that means that uh, the fluctuation of the baryon is very, very close to the fluctuation of the dark matter. So the stream velocity effect there will not play an important role. And this is at least how I understand it. So I think 65 is still a very good uh, value for the first star. <laughs> But if I'll if I'll if I'll if it will happen in my in my lifetime, I'll be extremely happy because there are cool things that happening. Besides, surprises are very are will always uh, always a good thing to find. So. so there is a paper actually on the gamma ray burst of 9.6, and all we need is another factor of 10. Yeah, we're very close. 